good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Martina Jelekova, and this is Bev Jarvis. Bev and I are co-chairs of the Community Housing Affordability Collective, or CHUC for short. And as we begin this evening, evening's program, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, and Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Thank you, Martina, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of words I'd like to share with you about uh, the Community Housing Affordability Collective, or CHAC. Uh, the collective is the voice of stakeholders involved in housing affordability issues in Calgary. We are a network of individuals and organizations working together to make housing more affordable for all Calgarians uh, through cross-sector collaboration and community-based advocacy. CHAC membership has rep representation uh, from across the entire housing spectrum, from homelessness through to near market and market rental and home ownership. We advocate for affordable housing and housing affordability. We support choice along the entire housing spectrum. At CHAC, we're advocating to make the city of Calgary more livable for everyone, to ensure that Calgarians are safely and appropriately housed and their lifetime housing needs are met. We do this through working with cross-section of, sorry, of uh, stakeholders and housing providers. Uh, CHAC is nonpartisan. We are pro-affordability. Our work is guided through an action plan that includes focused collaborative projects to deliver on three key objectives an integrated approach to housing, a stable and diverse housing mix, and predictable and sustainable funding. <laughs> One of our key initiatives is the Common Vision Project. Uh, in Calgary, approximately 3.6% of our housing supply is affordable rental units. However, we are lagging behind the national average, which is 6%. As some of you may know, uh, in September of this year, CHAC released a common vision for affordable rental housing in Calgary. That vision is to add 15,000 new affordable rental units in Calgary in the next 10 years to achieve the national average. I, I, I don't know I, that I can match your flair with the, with, the, with the throwing of the leaves. It's awesome. So. Um, I'll try. I, I, I have a, I, I stapled my presentation. <laughs> Anyhow, so, <laughs> so the, the big budget, yeah. So the vision in Calgary, the common vision that we have, is to get to 15,000 affordable rentals in the next 10 years. So it's a big gap. Now, why do we feel we need to bridge this gap? I know that many of you know, but I'll say it again for those who don't. Uh, in our city, Tonight, there is nearly, nearly 3,000 people who are sleeping either in homeless shelters or have no roof at all. Calgary also has the lowest proportion of affordable housing or subsidized housing relative to other large uh, municipalities across Canada. We are about half that of national average. We also know that another 17,000 households are housed, but they are at risk of homelessness because they are earning $30,000 or less, so that can be 20,000, and they spend more than 50% of that income on rent, so they're clearly overspending. So not surprisingly, housing affordability challenges in Calgary are concentrated in the lower income households. Now, um, these, these numbers can sound daunting. You have 15,000 units that we need to build. We have 17,000 households in what we call core housing need. Uh, but despite the magnitude of, of the challenge, uh, there is good news. In Calgary, the affordable housing sector has the capacity and the expertise to realize development, and that's through collaboration with our private sector partners as well as our, all three orders of government. And um, it's the collaboration uh, that's what brings, up to, brings us together. Uh, that's why tonight is so important. Thank you, Martina. 
And uh, added to that, awareness. Awareness is the key critical first step uh, toward a solution. Uh, awareness is generated through events similar to this. We had the uh, opening doors conference this afternoon, well, today, earlier, all day. It was wonderful. Uh, for those of you who attended, there are a number of faces in the room I recognized from that event earlier. Uh, and of course, this unlocking doors panel discussion today also helps to create more awareness. Uh, these events are thought-provoking and they lead to dialogue, and that dialogue in turn, we hope, can lead to solutions. Our vision is 15,000 new affordable rental units uh, in the next decade. That's, that's big. And CHAC will be supporting housing providers and advocating with stakeholders, partners and all orders of government to work collaboratively to provide resources and to fund our efforts and those of all of you and others in the room providing housing. Uh, we appreciate this as an ambitious and, and lofty goal, but we believe we're up to the, the challenge. Thank you, Beth. So in the spirit of working together, we are very pleased to be here today, uh, tonight, for uh, Unlocking Doors discussion. Um, the event is co-presented by the Opening Doors Conference, as Beth mentioned, and the University of Calgary Faculty of Environmental Design. And they have assembled, I feel bad, you guys are behind me, but they have assembled a distinguished panel, an amazing panel of scholars to share their insight and their expertise on the subject of affordable housing, but also mixed income communities and city building in general. Now, lastly, then, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. Sasha Tsenkova, who is sitting here behind us. Sasha, you may want to wave. I know you are a celebrity, but there you go. Uh, Sasha is the Professor of International Development and Planning, Faculty of, of Environmental Design, University of Calgary. Sasha holds not just one PhD, but two PhDs, one in architecture and one in planning. I am partial to the one in architecture because it's from my hometown of Prague. Um, any people from Toronto? Sasha's second degree is from Toronto. <laughs> All right, you may be partial to her planning degree. Sasha, Sasha's research and professional activities are truly broad. Uh, they've included projects uh, for the World Bank, uh, Council of Europe, and the United Nations. And Sasha's work took her to more than 20 countries in Europe, Latin America, and Central Asia. Sasha is the chair of tonight's panel, so please join me in welcoming Sasha. Thank you, Martina. Um, in the spirit of sharing and knowledge creation, I, I would like to, uh, to share my enthusiasm for tonight's discussion and our partnership uh, with CHAC, um, the collective that represents about 50 organizations committed to affordable housing in this city, but also our partnership with the City of Calgary, City of Edmonton, also uh, many faculties across the University of uh, Calgary, uh, funded generously by the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, uh, which allowed us to um, start planning a year ago for uh, a partnership for affordable housing conference. It starts tomorrow morning and we have about 20 presenters practitioners, planners, as well as scholars that will be here in the city representing the best experiences from cities around the world, but also cities in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, Edmonton, uh, as well as Calgary, Montreal, and, and Ottawa. Our contributions are available on this website, so you're welcome to download them and share that, uh, that knowledge. Uh, we are very proud to be part of that ongoing dialogue on affordable housing in the city. The issues are really critical, not just for Calgary, but also for cities across Canada. We have about 5 million uh, people that are in core housing need. 80% of those are renters, and more than 60% of, of uh, these people are part of cities. Um, the challenge of affordable housing is indeed global. The call for action is local. Around 1.6 billion people around the world in cities 
do not have access to affordable housing. So this is a very big and very significant conversation. Uh, cities around the world, and uh, some experiences will be featured today, cities such as London, Paris, um, also New York, Chicago, um, and many others have joined their efforts with partners to make sure that affordable housing is brought forward to the agenda. And we see a great deal of commitment to transformative change. With that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Kath Scanlon, is Deputy Director of LSE London, uh, London School of Economics Research Center. She specializes in housing uh, with an interest in international comparative studies. She has written uh, on housing systems and the financing of private and social housing in the UK and Europe, and is the lead editor of Social Housing in Europe. Since 2015, Kath has focused on ways of accelerating housing production in London and the challenge of producing affordable housing in a city with high land costs. With that, I'll turn it over to Kath to start her presentation. Thank you, Sasha. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Calgary. I'm, uh, I work at the London School of Economics and I've lived in London for 29 years, but I'm originally from Southern Arizona. And uh, so it just, to come to somewhere where I can look out and see mountains on the horizon, it almost makes me want to cry because um, for all of London's many, many wonderful features, uh, you don't see any mountains on the horizon. In fact, you don't see the horizon. All you see is trees and buildings and, and people. Um, so it, I, I feel free being here. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, partnerships and mixed communities in England and, and focus specifically on London. Now, who in the audience has been to London? Just so I can, okay, lots of you, great. Um, so w after this, next time you go to London, you can um, do a little tour of some social housing highlights. I'm sure nothing would enthuse your families more than to hear that you're gonna go look at some social housing. My 16-year-old daughter, I can tell you, is one of her favorite things to do. Um, so I, 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 I'm going to do a lightning trip through the history of affordable housing in London in five slides. So this is a picture of actually a street that's very close to where my office is now, now in London. It doesn't exist in, anymore. It was raised to make way for a new uh, road project. But this shows the kind of poverty that Charles Dickens wrote about that uh, was documented by Charles Booth in his famous uh, poverty maps of London. Uh, it shows the kind of squalor and overcrowding and uh, just the really terrible conditions that led to the Victorian philanthropists' um, efforts to improve housing for poor people. This is an example of one of those early efforts. This uh, is a Peabody estate. Now, George Peabody was actually an American philanthropist from Massachusetts. It, um, there's a town called Peabody, Massachusetts that's just near Salem, and he founded that town. Um, and he, he came to London and, and started something called the Peabody Trust that built uh, respectable housing for low-income working people. And a lot of these uh, estates still exist. This one is in Chelsea. It's not far from Harrods and still is owned by the Peabody Trust and is rented out at social rents. Now, the, the Peabody Trust estate that I, sh that I just showed is owned by a housing association, but uh, much of the social housing in London is owned by local authorities or by councils. And so when people talk about council housing, that's what we would call public housing in the States. Uh, this was the first council house to be, the first council estate to be built in London. It's the Boundary Estate in Shoreditch in East London. And this is, um, the, the picture is taken from a, a circular park that's in the middle of this estate, and the streets go out in a radial way from, from the center. And it's 
uh, iconic, you know, visited by city planners from all over the world. It's, they're, they're very beautiful buildings. We jump now to the 1960s, and this is more like the image that people have if you, t if you say social housing in England. This is the kind of place that people think of. This is a 1960s uh, concrete estate called the Brandon Estate in Kennington, South London. I like this one because I cycle through it every morning on my way to work. And um, in the middle of this uh, group of big identical blocks is uh, a statue of a reclining figure by Henry Moore. And uh, the local authorities in a bit of a... Um, th they're, they're a little bit worried about it. They don't like having it there because it's worth probably tens of millions of pounds. Um, and that lately there's been several incidents of vandalism of big s sculptures and public works of art in London. So they, they're trying to think of what else to do with it. But for the moment, it's lying in the middle of these towers. So all of the ones that I have showed you so far were single tenure built only to be social housing. We don't build those anymore. This is what is the kind of thing that we're building now. This is uh, Ely Court in uh, North London. It's a mixed tenure estate built by a partnership between a developer, a private developer, and a housing association. It's won lots of prizes and, and it was finished a couple of years ago. So historically in England, social housing was synonymous with affordable housing. And I, we heard in the introduction that uh, Calgary has, what was it, three and a half or four percent of the stock is uh, affordable rented housing. Well, in London, about 25 percent of the housing stock is social, rented at social rents. That's a decline for over the last 30 years. It used to be more than 30 percent. Most of this social housing was, in the past, provided by the local authorities on single tenure estates. However, over the last few decades, the system has changed quite a bit. Um, Mrs. Thatcher, you might have heard of her, she was elected in uh, 1979, and uh, she, one of her main policies in the housing sector was to introduce the right to buy, which gave the tenants of uh, council homes the opportunity to buy their homes at a big discount to the market value. Um, this was not for tenants of housing association homes, just for those who lived in, in homes that were owned by the local authorities. And uh, many, many people took up this opportunity, and it did lead to more mix on what were formerly um, single tenure estates. At the same time, she required that, uh, or, or she suggested that local authorities want, should think about asking the tenants if they wanted to transfer the stock from the ownership of the local authority to the ownership of a housing association, because she thought that uh, local governments shouldn't be in the business of running housing. So a lot of local authorities did go through this process and simply transfer all of their stock to a housing association. I mean, in a, in a way, it was kind of a transfer in name only because these housing associations were made up of all of the staff that used to work for the local authority housing department, and they usually you know, often stayed working in the same buildings and so on. It was just the name of the organization that changed. But, but formally, legally, they did transfer their stock. Perhaps most importantly, um, the local authorities used to be the country's biggest house builders. If you look at who built the housing in England and London in the 1960s and the 1970s, the big wave of house building after World War II, most of the housing was built by local authorities. Mrs. Thatcher stopped that completely. She said no more construction by local authorities. So what happens now? Now most new affordable housing is built by private developers through a process that we call, in shorthand terms, Section 106. That's Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, if you want to look up the details. And it, 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 it works, it's a form of inclusionary zoning. What happens is that 
in order to get planning permission to build a new housing scheme, the developer must commit to providing a proportion of those homes as affordable. What proportion is that? Well, the mayor of London has said that on any scheme with more than 10 units in London, the expectation is that the developer should provide 35% affordable housing. And if it's on public land, on land that's owned by a local authority or a hospital or a prison or something, it should be 50%. But the expectation is that all new residential development should be mixed communities. So those affordable homes that have to be provided through this avenue have, have to be in the same location. They can't be in another neighborhood or around the corner. And, and generally the expectation is that you, you shouldn't be able to tell them apart from the market homes. They should all look the same and so on. Now, of course, new housing is only a tiny amount of the, of the housing stock in London. We're, we're only building less than 1% a year. Um, but even on older estates, mixed communities have evolved over time because of the right to buy. So one uh, kind of can of worms in London is what do we mean by the word affordable? Um, so traditionally, I, I, I said earlier that that when we talked about affordable housing, we were usually talking about social housing. And social housing in London rents for less than 50% of market rent. It's, it's very inexpensive compared to market rents. But over the last 20, 25 years, the government has introduced a range of products that target the intermediate market. So they cost more than social housing, but less than market prices. Most of these are rental products, but there are some uh, affordable home ownership products. And these count within that 35% affordable housing envelope. So there's a negotiation about how much affordable housing a developer is going to provide. Is it going to be 35%, 40%? Can the developer get it down to 30%? And then there's a negotiation about within that envelope, what's the proportion of social rent, what's the proportion of intermediate rent, and so on. Um, I can talk about that in more detail if you want to hear later, but um, now I'm going to move on to uh, what Sasha asked me to talk about was partnership. So I, I'm going to say something about how partnership is working now in England. So producing genuinely affordable housing in places like London, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world, requires subsidy. That either has to be in the form of money uh, or in, increasingly in the form of low-cost land. Now, the subsidies for producing affordable housing have been cut and cut and cut in England over the last uh, decades. They're, they're much, much less generous than they used to be. Public sector bodies do have land, but they don't anymore have development expertise. In the 60s and 70s, when local authorities were building huge amounts of housing, they had their own departments of architecture, they had their own builders, all that is gone. Uh, local authorities don't have that capacity in-house anymore. Housing associations do have that capacity, but they need land. So there's the opportunity for, for partnership. Housing associations are mainly charitable organizations whose mission is to provide housing. Um, but they are very different creatures than the housing associations uh, that you find here. There's been a wave of consolidations in the housing association sector that has created some really enormous players. Clarion is the biggest uh, in England. It owns 125,000 homes across the whole country. Notting Hill Genesis owns 110,000, and it builds uh, over 11,000 homes a year. And if you look at the top 10 house builders in England, three or four of them are housing associations. So let's quickly look at a few examples of uh, mixed communities, and old and new, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, 
Here's an existing estate. This is the Millbank estate in Westminster. This is about 300 yards from the Houses of Parliament. It's a beautiful arts and crafts uh, listed building that was originally public housing and now is about 50% privately owned uh, because of right to buy. And the private uh, flats are, go on sale for over a million pounds each. So those, those people are living in the same buildings with the social tenants. In Brighton, which is directly south of London on the coast, um, there, there's an example of a partnership between a local authority and a housing association called Hyde Housing Association. They created a 50-50 joint venture to acquire a site and build some homes for sub-market rent and shared ownership with the rents linked to local incomes. The goal is to build 1,000 genuinely affordable homes for local people. They haven't built, built any yet. Uh, but here's a, an image of the, what they're planning to build on a former industrial estate in Brighton. Uh, I won't talk about that one. Finally, here is an example of something that is existing now. This is some key worker housing built by Thames Valley Housing Association in Surrey. Uh, that was, whoops. That's a partnership between a hospital and a housing association. The hospital needs somewhere for its workers to live because uh, hospital employees are public sector workers in the UK and their salary doesn't vary depending on where they live. Um, and they worked with the housing association to convert some land that they owned into housing that their, that their employee, employees could access. So I'll stop there and I'll hand it over to Sasha. Thank you very much, Kath. Um, let me introduce the next pre presenter. Alex Schwartz is a professor of public and urban policy at the New School in New York. He's the author of Housing Policy in the United States and also co-author of Policy Analysis as Problem Solving. His research has appeared in many journals such as Cityscape, Economic Development Quarterly, Housing Policy Debate, Housing Studies, and he's also a managing editor for North America for the International Journal of Housing Studies. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And so now we're going from one big city, expensive city, to another, from London uh, to New York. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, mixed income housing and its history and variety in New York City and mixed income housing in the context of the city's broader efforts to provide various kinds of affordable housing in the city. Um, first off, it's important to emphasize that this is nothing new to New York City. Uh, the concept of income mixing, although it may not have been called that, has really been ingrained in the city's housing programs at least since the 1930s, if not before. It's also important to point out that while New York City shares many commonalities with other cities in its approach to mixed income housing, it also does things differently as well. And I'll touch on that briefly. And then I'm gonna talk more about some of the more current uh, examples. So the key commonalities I would say are one, this notion of inclusionary zoning, which Kath already mentioned the idea of uh, requiring a variety of income groups uh, in a development as a condition for permission to build the housing or as an incentive so that a developer can build more housing than uh, the developer otherwise would. Uh, another example is what we call 80-20 uh, programs, whereby a government or finance agency provides lower cost uh, loans, bonds, uh, which is predicated on the assumption that about 20% of the units would be allocated to lower income people with lower costs. And this model we see across the country. Some cities and states have adopted more extensively than others, and New York City certainly has. Um, a key difference with New York C comparing New York City to other US cities is that in much of the country, mixed income housing is associated with the redevelopment of public housing, with the tearing down of public housing and replacing it with mixed income communities, developments where a portion of the units 
are public housing and the rest are, peop are households of higher incomes. And in many cases, mixed income housing is associated with a reduction in the number of deeply affordable units. That's not the case in New York City. New York City has not demolished any of its public housing, although public housing is in dire shape right now, but it has not been demolished. Uh, so that's a big difference. Another difference which I'm gonna emphasize is that the mixed income housing programs in New York have tended, especially in recent years under the current mayor, to target lower income households or households with lower incomes than is usually the case with other mixed, mixed income programs. And the percentage of mixed income units tends to be higher than we see in other uh, mixed income programs. So I think those are the key differences between New York City and other places around the country. So what motivates the city to provide mixed income housing? I would argue there are two key reasons, one of which I think is probably more important, or the other one may get more of the rhetoric. Uh, the key reason, I think, is that it leverages private resources, private money, so that you can support or cross-subsidize lower income units by having market rate or more expensive units in the same uh, building or development, the income from those units can augment the lower income associated with the lower income units. Uh, and without those, that income from the higher income units, it would not be possible to provide housing for the lower income families unless you had more direct government subsidy. And the other motivation, of course, is the idea of creating mixed income communities and the variety of benefits it's, that is said to be associated with that. And I believe Mark will probably talk more about that. Some of the developers of mixed income housing in New York are very firm believers in the virtues of creating mixed income communities, although the evidence of that, I think, is, is mixed. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. So briefly, the key sort of legacies or the earlier forms of mixed income housing in New York City, I think the most important example perhaps is public housing, where in the rest of the country it's associated with housing for the least well off, as associated with extreme concentrations of poverty. In New York, until relatively recently, the city has always made an effort to include uh, working families, people with earnings, people with higher incomes, along with very low-income families, people on public assistance of various kinds. Um, many years ago, I was involved in a study looking at what was then considered to be gentrification in Harlem. This is in the early 80s. And I was looking at census data, looking at indicators of possible gentrification in terms of people with higher education, higher incomes. And when we looked at this data at a sort of granular level, it turned out all the examples, all the households, or most of them, were in public housing. They weren't in private housing at that time. Uh, over the years, the percentage of higher income, middle income people in public housing has declined, but it's still higher than other cities. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, point to keep in mind. And of course, New York has always been very involved in this notion of 80-20 housing, also providing tax, ex tax abatements, other tax, property tax incentives, again, so that developers will provide low-income housing as a condition for having a, a tax break, where they pay much less in the way of property taxes than they otherwise would. But I'm gonna focus primarily now on more recent efforts to provide mixed income housing. And a lot of this is in the context of New York City's mayoral programs, the uh, you know, local level initiatives, uh, starting with Mayor Koch in 1986, uh, committing billions of dollars in the city's capital budget, that is through its general obligation bonds, to provide housing for the homeless as well as for other low and moderate income families. And cumulatively, uh, the city has um, invested more than $17 billion uh, after inflation, so even more if you just look at nominal dollars, um, for the um, preservation and construction of um, almost 500,000 units. Again, this is over a long period of time. But under Mayor de Blasio, who currently has a plan to be able to preserve 300,000 units with costs of billions of dollars over the period of 2014 to 2026. Uh, so 
you know, New York is a big city, it's almost nine million people, but it still is a much larger initiative using its own resources in a way that no other city in the United States comes close to. Uh, mixed income housing has been uh, vital to many of these programs under these different mayors. Uh, originally, most of the city's efforts have looked at the renovation of housing and property land that the city already owned through tax foreclosure. In the 1970s, 80s, because of property tax arrears, the city had foreclosed upon well over 100,000 units of housing vacant and occupied. Uh, great parts of New York, the South Bronx, Harlem, Central Brooklyn were abandoned with huge amounts of vacant land, vacant buildings, or partially occupied buildings, all under city ownership. And starting with Mayor Koch, the city invested billions into restoring these buildings, renovating them or building new on the vacant land. And the mixed income housing played a role in this. So I'm just gonna give you a couple examples here. This is something called New Settlement Houses, New Settlement Apartments, uh, which was um, developed by a very large nonprofit uh, housing organization called Settlement Housing Fund. This was a very large complex of gutted out buildings in, in the South Bronx. And over time, the city now has completed over, over 1,000 units. Now, 30% of them have been reserved for people who were formerly homeless, coming out of the homeless shelter system. 40% were low income, 20% considered moderate income, and then 10% were market rate. Uh, no differentiation between the units, people were randomly mixed within each floor. And this has been a sort of the, the catalyst for the redevelopment, revitalization of a neighborhood that still is very low income, but with far more resources than it had before, including new schools, new community centers. Uh, this is a before and after picture of what it looked like before and was totally gutted out and what it looks like now. More recently, well, since the late 1990s, the city has stopped foreclosing on properties and tax arrears. Uh, so most of its development activity, two minutes? Most of its development activity has been on privately owned land, uh, requiring new construction. And the city has done a lot of very large construction projects. This is an award-winning one, a partnership between a nonprofit and a for-profit owner, owner called Via Verde. Uh, and now under Mayor de Blasio, there have been a lot of mixed income models under inclusionary zoning, mandatory inclusionary zoning. So whenever a city rezones a neighborhood, 25% uh, of the units are dedicated for lower income households, including a portion who, have who are formerly homeless. And uh, five neighborhoods have been rezoned to date. And then, I'm sure you can't read this, but they've created other models. This one is called low, Extremely Low Income Assistance, or ELLA, where 10% of the units are formerly homeless, or in some cases, 30%. And then other units are designated for different income categories, going up to about 60% of area median family income. And this is an example of one of those very large scale development. This would be a total of 1,000 units altogether when it's done. And another mixed income model, uh, 40 to 60 percent are earning up to 60 percent of area median family income, and the rest are earning uh, considerably more. And this is another example. This is from Jamaica, New York, and the Queens. Very, again, very large scale. So briefly, uh, there's a lot of controversy and criticism with these programs. One is cons concern about segregation and stigma, that even though it's mixed income, the households aren't always intermixing, or living together. There was a controversy for a while about poor doors, where the lower income people were, had to go into a separate entrance. And with the rezoning, there's been consideration, concerns about gentrification, that the change in the physical fabric of the neighborhood is going to increase overall costs, inspire, uh, make landlords want to evict existing low income tenants, and um, there are other concerns that the low-income units really are not affordable uh, to the lowest-income people in these neighborhoods. I think I have to stop there, and we'll happy to talk more questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Alex. Uh, appreciate this uh, really robust overview of different programs in the city of New York um, that meet the needs of a um, variety of people. The next presenter is Marietta Hafner. She um, is um, uh, working at the European Comparative Studies at Delft University of Technology, Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment in the Netherlands. Um, Marietta Hafner is a housing economist with uh, more than 25 years of experience uh, and active leadership in European Comparative Studies. Um, at Delft Institute of Technology, her research interests include financial and economic aspects of housing, housing policy. She's also um, a research uh, fellow at Cambridge University in UK and the RMIT um, in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Sasha. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. It's uh, always uh, very nice to um, exchange uh, experiences. Um, it turns out that countries are um, very different. Uh, so as you will see about uh, the Netherlands also, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, mixing neighborhoods, <laughs> since I don't really have na uh, mixed uh, projects uh, about the Netherlands. When I was thinking about the topic, I uh, was um, thinking there were a number of aspects. One of them is policy, of course, which is the second uh, point I, item I will be um, discussing. But the first one is our big social rental sector. So we'll start with that one. And um, both of these um, elements have been changing more recently, so there's a big question mark for the future about mixing neighborhoods. The large social rental sector, it started in 1901 with the housing law. The Netherlands um, determined that social housing would be provided by not-profit landlords or investors. So that's what's called social in the Netherlands. Uh, non-profit organizations have as legal status, not public, but they are private, registered, or licensed um, organizations with a public task. And this public task has changed in time. They operate within uh, the government framework in the interest of housing, and when they make any profits, they are to be re reinvested in housing. In the beginning, they were like uh, an extension of government. Actually, they didn't have much freedom. In due course, uh, say towards the 1990s, I'm taking a few big steps, <laughs> they moved from arm's length organization towards social entrepreneurs. They got more freedom, also more financial freedom, and towards a, a revolving fund model. So they had to uh, work without subsidization, they had to sell dwellings if they wanted to um, build new social rental dwellings. So by 1995, they reached this, this uh, sector reached its largest share of 36% of stock in the Netherlands. What was built? Well, I go back to the first slide. We already saw these. These are uh, garden villages in the north of uh, Amsterdam, which have been renovated, but they were originally built in 1920s. Here we have some examples of uh, typical 1950s medium rise housing. And these are the typical um, 1960s high rise housing. Um, some of the others I'll save for uh, later slides. Getting back to the social landlords and their public re responsibilities, they changed in time as well. Uh, 
So for instance, um, they have to improve the quality of the dwelling stock. They have to involve tenants in their policy making. For instance, if they want to renovate housing, they need to have 70% uh, of tenants agreeing that the um, landlord will renovate housing and will increase rents. But the more important ones in relationship to the topic of mixing um, neighborhoods are uh, the first one, housing lower income households, and the last one, stimulating the livability of neighborhoods. The, uh, the first one about housing lower income households, in principle was an aim, but there was never an income limit until 2012. So um, the usual thing was once you turned 18, you would register for a housing association and once uh, you, your, your turn came along, um, you would get an offer. So in that way, um, let's say neighborhoods got mixed because not everybody had a low income in a certain neighborhood and once your income rose, you didn't have to leave your housing, you just stayed. The other one is uh, newer, stimulating livability of um, neighborhoods which was, became a task in 1979 of housing associations. And they did that um, by allocation policies, for instance, according to lifestyle or according to income. Uh, if some neighborhoods needed stronger income groups, uh, the choice was made for that. And they also got a task in neighborhood restructuring, which I will talk about uh, later again because there is another topic in relation to uh, social landlords that helped uh, to mix neighborhoods, and that's an intermediate tenure called affordable home ownership. It exists since 1978. There's no involvement by government. It was a sector initiative, and there were different models. And why did it come about? At the end of the 70s, home ownership became really expensive, house prices started rising, and uh, therefore this initiative was taken as one of the reasons. Renewed interest in the 1990s. Again, um, home ownership um, became uh, more expensive. On the other hand, not everyone could enter access social renting. So uh, the social landlords tried to introduce a scheme that allowed for cheaper home ownership. It was a lower risk home ownership um, because um, the, uh, when you bought the dwelling as a tenant or anybody against a lower price than the market price, um, when you wanted to sell it again, you had to resell it to the housing, uh, to the social landlord, and you shared capital gains and losses. So because of that, the price was lower. Why would the social landlord um, do such a policy? First, uh, the asset management policy, as I explained, uh, they had to operate as a revolving fund, meaning they had to get revenues next to rent revenues. They could get revenues by selling the houses in these schemes, and they could get buy them back later when they, uh, when they were resold, and they could then again think about whether it should be a social rental dwelling or whether it could be resold again to a next tenant. And it would help them mix neighborhoods because people buying dwellings uh, were a little better off. Um, well, that was the social rental landlords uh, that had a big role in mixing neighborhoods in the Netherlands. But ne next to that, there were also policies. Um, the first one, it was a restructuring of neighborhoods, which had different versions throughout the last century. It started off, of course, since World War II with the demolition of uh, lots of dwellings and uh, just new construction. After 1970, it was called urban renewal, no longer only demolition, but it was building for the neighborhood, building back uh, affordable or social rental dwellings. Only in the 1990s, uh, there was a social aspect introduced and the mixed neighborhood became a policy concept. 
From 1995 to 2015, there was a big cities policy, uh, which um, in the end, uh, the government also offered some money, in the, which was called the investment budget urban restructuring, which worked from 2000 to 2015. It was like a multiplier effect, just you know, for each uh, euro uh, spent for the government money, there should be some private money going into this as well. There was a big role for social landlords, as you uh, already understood, because they had a task in uh, improving livability in neighborhoods. So a lot of this urban renewal, urban restructuring, urban regeneration was done by uh, social landlords, but based on this, these policies. Two minutes. Uh -huh. I have to speed up maybe a little bit. There was also another policy, which was um, new neighborhoods at city edges. So these were large-scale programs to try to uh, construct for the population growth and to vacate uh, social rental dwellings in inner cities for uh, the, those in need. So you see the policy changed already a little bit from broad segments of the population to uh, poorer uh, households. Um, so part of the policy was not mixing because the richer people were moving out of the cities. On the other hand, even though this policy was um, aimed for the edges of the city, 39% of those dwellings realized under this policy were in inner cities. So in the end, there was also some mixing. Um, there were still some supply side subsidies and uh, provinces and municipalities agreed on where this uh, was happening. So then we can uh, finally reach the future. And why? Because, um, oh, by the way, you see here some social renting from the 1980s and 1990s. Because what I was explaining has all changed. And you probably noticed on the, on the programs, on the policies, they all ended in the end uh, 2015 or earlier. We have three recessions after the global financial crisis austerity measures, no new program, no new national programs. Um, so, and furthermore, the social landlords, their position also changed when they were, were got, uh, got to be a revolving fund, social entrepreneurship. In first instance, in the 90s, their tasks broadened, they could focus on providing home ownership, building neighborhood, uh, uh, public buildings uh, for uh, entertainment or whatever, all kinds of things they did. Uh, but more recently, since 2010, the governments have decided that um, they should, back to the core business, targeting of social housing, um, they got less autonomy, less financial autonomy, the sector has already decreased. It is still 30% on average uh, national, but it used to be 36%. So the policies have already been working. Um, and a third player, the uh, municipalities, they've never had enough uh, funds. Yes, I should finish. <laughs> never had enough funds uh, to do any of this. They were dependent on national government. So, um, yeah, at the moment, uh, there are discussions going on what the future will be. Uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods are increasing again, um, and there are different streams. Should we counter this, or should we control negative effects of uh, segregation um, and these kind of um, developments? Um, questions about these uh, for later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marietta. And we are coming to our last presenter, and, and hopefully that's the end of my draconial role of uh, timekeeper, which I really don't enjoy very much, particularly when there are people that have so much to say. Mark um, Joseph is uh, Associate Professor of Community Development at uh, the School of Applied Social Sciences, Case Western Reserve University in the U.S., He's also the founding director of the U.S. National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities 
and um, he's the co-author of Integrating the Inner City, The Promise and Perils of Mixed Income Public Housing Transformation. He received his PhD in public policy from the University of Chicago and his undergraduate degree from Harvard University. With that, to Mark. All right, thanks, Sasha. You got space for one more? Can we squeeze one more in tonight? All right. You all have been very, very patient, so I promise to stay within my time so we can open up and hear from you. I'm sure you've got many, many questions already. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to give some context, talk about what we've learned, uh, a kind of a broader picture across the U.S. than you got from Alex. He focused on New York. I'm going to talk a little bit nationally. I want to talk about our approach at our Mixed Income Center and then just give you some illustrations of our work so you know what you might want to ask more questions about later. Uh, you may have heard we're going through some interesting times in the U.S. Uh, as around the world. Um, so our starting point for this conversation about mixed income communities is bigger than just our affordable housing crisis. And we do have an affordable housing crisis in most of our cities. But it's really an existential crisis in my mind of where America is going. Who gets to belong in America? Where can you live in America? And we think mixed income communities are one part of a solution to that. So there are two main questions that drive our research. One is how do we decrease concentrated poverty? But the other one is the flip side to that. How do we promote and sustain racially and economically diverse communities? And it's good that I'm coming at the end of this conversation because much of our work is really about the people and the communities rather than the housing. So I think everything that's come before me sets up a platform. The questions we ask is how does it work once it's built? And to what extent do these communities really thrive? So very quick peek at our initiative, and we urge you to jump on our website if you don't know about us, National Initiative on Mixed Income Community. We've got lots of information there about mixed income communities in the US. Uh, many of you probably know there's been a long history of mixed income development, so you can kind of scan down that. But really, since the 1970s, a number of initiatives to plan and incentivize mixed income housing. This just gives you a quick peek. We have a mixed income database on our website. And so these are some of the mixed income developments we've identified around the country. And this gives you a quick sense of the cities in which my center is currently working, either research projects or consulting projects. And Sasha mentioned our book, Integrating the Inner City, which is about Chicago. And we also have a number of other um, reports you might be interested in. And then we do a range, as I mentioned, of consulting projects with developers, uh, city departments, housing authorities, and others. A question I'm also often asked is about what mixed income success would be. How would you measure it? How do you know if you're successful? And so we came up with this framework based on hundreds of interviews with a variety of residents and other stakeholders involved in mixed income communities. Quite simple. And so these, these six areas that would make up components of success how the site itself changes and is redeveloped, how the neighborhood around that site then changes, to what extent there's successful resident relocation or move to another location in the city, to what extent are new residents attracted and retained on the site and in the neighborhood, and then are there inclusive, what we call inclusive social dynamics among the residents, the mixed residents of these new communities, and then finally, to what extent are the residents on the lower income end able to use the mixed income housing as a platform to a different kind of economic trajectory? Or are they remaining poor? And very quickly, what we're finding is a couple areas I would say we've been very successful, and that tends to be on the physical redevelopment end and those immediate impacts, safety, amenities, property increases. Where I think we've been mixed success is in resident uh, return and relocation. Very low rates across the US in terms of how many residents get to come back to these developments that are redeveloped. And as far as attraction and retention, I think more success than some might have thought at having people move onto the sites, but then a lot of turnover once they are moving there. And then finally, the two areas that really concern us, I would say, keep us up at night. Uh, one is the social dynamics. We are creating mixed income housing, but we're not creating mixed income communities. And then we're seeing residents of these developments, uh, despite being in, develop in housing that they love, the quality, the location, they're still remaining desperately poor and in very tenuous economic circumstances, even after living in these mixed income developments for many years. 
So I think what that le leads to is the housing for us is just the beginning. Even though it's complicated in and of itself to get that, you really need to think about issues of belonging and voice and connection and then think about what kind of strategies you'll have for economic mobility and the creation of jobs and job access. So a number of implications then. Affordable housing is critical but not sufficient. Much earlier in proactive thinking about the post-occupancy phase, we find the developers time to tend to take it step by step, and we think they need to be thinking about further stages down the line earlier. Far more vigilant and intentional about promoting inclusion beyond just resident integration, and shifting of what we call the operating culture of a place from one of fear uh, to one of aspiration, and from one of silos and siloed action and siloed kind of hunkering down, in the words of Robert Putnam, uh, to synergy and connection. Uh, much greater focus, as I said, on education and economic mobility as a part of the strategy, not something that will kind of take care of itself. And then we really think that the front line of this work are the property managers and that there's far too little attention on the property management industry and property man management roles as a part of successful mixed income communities. So at our research center, we teamed up with folks from a group called Trusted Space Partners and I encourage you to Google them. They are wizards of community building. And so it, with our partnership, which we call Triple Aim Impact, we've brought them into the mixed income space and so we're working in several places together to try to build, bring in more community building, community network building techniques, and we can talk more about that. Our recommendations to housing developments is that there's two key missing ingredients in how they think about their work. One is that there are too few what we would call aspirational relationships. The relationships tend to be very client-driven, dependency-oriented, punitive in many ways, as opposed to creating aspiration among the households in these developments and very little sense of self-agency. Much of what is done takes away the agency of the residents as opposed to giving them a sense of empowerment over their lives, their housing, their communities, their families. And so we think these are two missing ingredients. And I'll just close with a few illustrations of places we're working. Uh, the New Communities Initiative is in Washington, D.C. It's about 12, 13 years old. Um, and it's a four neighborhood public transformation, transformation initiative. We are working on the community engagement strategy there. On the other coast, our west coast, um, is Hope SF in San Francisco, California. If you don't know about it, I would draw your attention to it. I think it's one of the leading housing initiatives focused on racial equity. The director refers to it as a reparations initiative, and I think they're really pushing the envelope in terms of how to engage residents and push on questions of race and stigma and marginalization. Uh, we are forming a mixed income innovation and action network among these four cities, Seattle, Memphis, Minneapolis, and King County, where we're hoping to really push, again, push the envelope on mixed income community building. And then where I come from in Cleveland, uh, there's a building in which we've become embedded, 200 unit building that's gonna go undergo a $30 million mixed income transformation. Our goal is to make sure that all 144 of the low income housing residents get to stay and then when it's rebuilt, they feel like they belong and in fact have a true voice in the community. This building is a block away from our school, from my office, and so we get to be engaged in there every day. And then finally, we have an effective neighboring project also in Cleveland, which is just on two city blocks, two street blocks, where we're honing in on, in a kind of organic, naturally occurring, diverse community, what are the dynamics among neighbors? And can we do interventions on the block to try to get people to cross lines of race and class in more effective ways? And with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, this made my job so much easier, indeed. Uh, now we are going to open um, the session for questions from the audience. Uh, I think we had uh, the privilege of hearing great narratives about a strong legacy of uh, social housing and indeed affordable rental housing provision in some of the greatest uh, cities in the world, um, New York, London, Amsterdam, uh, but also the importance of uh, inclusionary development 
uh, inclusive housing, the importance of community building, because it's not just about homes, but it's also about people and making places. Uh, so I hope that with that um, uh, introduction, you would have a number of questions that we could address through our panelists. So we would move the mics in sort of a cluster-based strategy because we have only two mics, I think. So there's a lot of sharing that needs to happen and collaboration, so please, people, do collaborate. So do I uh, see hands for some questions? Oh, hi. Uh, question. uh, this is Jay from OpenGate. So I actually have a question for Alex. So as uh, New York City becomes one of Amazon's headquarters to what kind of impact does it have on the local affordable housing? What kind of challenges you, you see or what kind of opportunities do you see? The reason I'm asking because we're Calgary is recovering and I believe one day we will face the same situation and your experience is very valuable to us. Yeah, it, it was just announced. Uh, there's a fair amount of controversy. I mean, the, this is one of the few things that the mayor and the governor could agree on which to allow, you know, to provide these incentives so that Amazon could could uh, bring in, I think it's uh, 25,000 or so jobs over a period of time with an average pay of $100,000 in an area right across the East River from Manhattan, which happens to be designated now as a distressed area. So under this new economic development tax incentive program, Amazon will get even more money for it. There's a lot of concern that already there's a lot of pressure in terms of housing markets, uh, gentrification, uh, the transportation system is already stressed. Uh, to what degree Amazon and the city and state will try to offset that is a concern. The nation's largest public housing development in the country is right there. Uh, Amazon says they'll, they'll have some job fairs and resume workshops to help, not very inspiring. So there's a lot of concern about this. There's a group called City um, ANHD, which is a coalition of housing developers, affordable housing developers. They just put out a statement about this, which you could look at. Thank you, my name is Joey Stewart and I serve on the Calgary Public Art Board. And I'm really interested to hear how you, what your policies are to use public art as a way of humanizing and making more beautiful those spaces. And I'm also very curious about what you do with play spaces, because my dream is that kids that live in, in rich neighborhoods or in more affluent neighborhoods, if they could see that poor children had playgrounds that were way better than theirs, it would be a marvelous way of integrating those communities and get, letting those children get to know each other. Uh, in terms of public art, I did mention the Henry Moore sculpture that's in the, in the um, estate in Southwark. That is very much an anomaly. There is no requirement to use a percentage of the budget for public art, as there is in some places I know in the States. Uh, and if, if, if public art is uh, put in place, it's usually the, the developers that target the really high-end market. So uh, schemes that are being sold to um, investors from the Middle East and, and so on will have a fountain in the middle and you know a sculptures of horses galloping and things like that. But um, on uh, projects where they are regenerating social housing estates, there's not usually art as art included, although there is, um, they do put a lot, a lot of effort into design and public realm. Um, in terms of playgrounds, what is being built at, in London at the moment is mostly high density, um, either six to 12 story kind of mid-rise blocks around courtyards or high, you know, properly high rise, 40, 45 story blocks of flats. There is always a requirement that, there's, that they put in playgrounds, that they put in provision for children. But what we're finding is that in housing like that, um, people who have a choice about whether to live there, that is people who are not living in the social housing, almost never have children. Because families with children in, in, 
England want to live in a house, a house with a garden. So these, some of these places do have amazing playgrounds, um, and the children of the social tenants get to enjoy them, but they are not re the way the, the urban fabric works in London, people don't come from other neighborhoods to use them. But maybe in the long term, you know, as these developments mature and families do start staying in them, we will see that, that kind of magnet effect. And yes, uh, back to your point, Mark, because it's not just about physical rebuilding and creating a social mix through uh, the physical uh, built environment, but it's also about building that social capital and the community ties, which is really a long-term project. So several of the US mixed income developments have actually done a nice job of incorporating public art. And one of the best ones would be a development called Greenbridge, which is in the Seattle area. So you could Google that and see some of their, they've got gorgeous art that they've used. But in particular, with a meaning uh, that kind of expresses something to reflect the local culture, I think a question does come in is to what extent is art used to capture some of the history and the heritage and the tradition of what existed prior? Uh, as opposed to something that's just there with a sense of the incoming residents and kind of what they would want to see. So to the, on that note, I was actually having a debate with my wife last night because I was at a community meeting in a public housing development in Cleveland and they found, they discovered a couple decades ago, this uh, 1940s era art, works, work progress administration art, which are these images of labor and engineering and technology. The problem is it's all white people. And so I was in this development that is 100% African American and literally up against all the walls are these massive images and they're gorgeous, but it's all white people. And what's interesting to me is I don't think many people just even think about it. They just, it's just part of the fabric. I mean, I think of the kids going up there. So when I told my wife about it, I showed her a photo. She's like, you have to say something. You have to call the CEO. You have to do something. It's like, I mean, it's so far beyond that. One other quick point about uh, amenities on site that kind of could bring people onto the site. I think it's an excellent idea. And you actually have here in Canada the best example, I talk about it all the time, of an amenity on a mixed income site that draws people to it. I'm wondering if anyone knows what that is and where that might be. It's in Toronto. And what's the amenity? The Aquatic Center. So Regent Park in Toronto has the best aquatic center in the entire metropolitan area that draws people from all over. And I think that's something that mixed income communities should do more and more of, is think about ways to integrate the site that way. And it's free. And it's free. And it's free. Um, and it's, it's, Regent Park is, is one of the uh, challenging stories of redeveloping the, the housing estates and the tower blocks. Uh, indeed, with a, a fine mix of um, projects, but also different housing partnerships that have set the tone for uh, neighborhood uh, redevelopment and city building. Um, other questions? Oh, at the back, okay. Hi, thank you for, I think, both the geographic and a spatial uh, 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 time-wise perspective of uh, affordable housing. And uh, this is probably something across the panel. Um, what is, have you observed sort of any cultural, um, I'd say, context or, um, or readiness about maintaining um, affordability and arguably dignity of mixed income spaces over time? Maintaining affordability, but also dignity yeah, so of people living in well, those mixed income. New, like, for instance, in New York, you, there's, uh, you talked about the poor doors. You see that in Vancouver and the Woodward's development. Um, as much as over the last 10 years, Vancouver's had a lot of uh, effort to try to do mixed income housing, but you're seeing a lot of that, that question of, it, does it remain affordable over time? And is it truly mixed behaviors? And I think it's a great perspective on behaviors, because that is a, a, a a very mixed result of have we truly mixed the incomes and are we truly I having integrated communities or are we just um, laying bare uh, uh, some, in, in this case, I think, in some p potentially cultural uh, 
a lack of cultural readiness for true mixed communities or integration. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, it, affects the, it affects the sort of the a question of the maintenance of that affordability over time too. You know, just because you built it affordable, does it actually stay affordable? And I think the Netherlands example of having, um, you know, the, the affordable home ownership is a model that Calgary is experimenting with as well. And is that really truly going to help maintain that? Because in the, my question around cultural context is in North America and especially in Calgary, home ownership is a main driver and is a cultural value of sorts. And so the maintenance of, ho of, ma of affordability over time is, is questioned. Um, I, I think that a lot of the, the presenters did talk about mixed income uh, projects where indeed a critical share of the housing is maintained as affordable. So it's either socially owned or under a policy regime that ensures that it will become uh, affordable also in the future. But there are also a number of subsidies that travel with people allowing them to stay in that place uh, and still continue to pay either 25 or 30 percent of their income in rent. But the, the cultural aspect is something that is uh, interesting to address. So any? Yeah, I'm not sure I can speak so much to the cultural aspect, but I think in New York the issue of preservation, the fact that housing does not remain affordable unless you make it so is something that was a hard one lesson. And the city now is spending billions of dollars trying to keep affordable housing or subsidized housing to continue those subsidies. And now with the uh, newer programs, the city's requiring that the affordable units stay affordable either indefinitely or for at least four decades. And because a lot of this housing is in desirable neighborhoods, and arguably all of New York now is a desirable neighborhood, that there is always acute demand for the higher end units. So I, don't, I wouldn't worry so much about the units no longer or losing their mixed income quality. Yes, about the Netherlands, as you uh, correctly uh, stated. Um, if you were living in social housing, uh, you were, it was just a normal option. It was not, you know, how do you say, um, stigmatized. Yeah, that's it. It was just normal. As I explained that uh, everybody turned age 18, they just put themselves on, on the waiting list for a housing association at that time. And uh, affordability is um, maintained uh, because as long as the housing is in the hands of the uh, social landlords in the Netherlands. So in that way, the context is different in different countries, though um, the definition of affordable changes in time because the Dutch government is um, taking away uh, money from the um, social landlords. They have to pay corporate income tax nowadays. They have to pay um, a special new um, property tax on rental dwellings with a cheap rent, up to 710 euros per month. Um, so, that way, uh, the uh, social landlords are being forced to increase rents. Next to that, there is, for the first time now, a discussion whether um, poor people, to call it that, can still live in the inner city of Amsterdam. When I started uh, my research um, in 1990, 90% of dwellings in Amsterdam were rental, and most of those were social. So when you were looking at maps and the distribution of rent levels, they would be high in Brussels, they would be high in London, they would be high in Paris, but they would be low in Amsterdam, the capital city of the Netherlands. So this is changing. We're following... Um, other countries. And the question is, how much leeway will um, housing associations or social landlords still have in the Netherlands in the future? And how, yeah, if certain neighborhoods is their ownership 
and they are to allocate 90% of dwellings to uh, low-income households. Yeah, so things are changing. <laughs> but in the past, it was dignified, and it was insured if you were living in social uh, uh, renting, because also um, rent contracts, rental contracts were indefinite. They still are, in principle. So you cannot be kicked out in general. Thank you. Just a, a quick word on culture, because I appreciate you putting it on the table. I think it's a critical component of how we think about these communities. There's a couple directions you could go. One is this question of kind of culture as stigma, right? Assumptions about particular groups. And this, we have a massive problem with in the US. Uh, there's stigma about public housing residents. There's stigma about residents of color. Uh, there's stigma about renters. And so for us, mixed tenure is actually a real challenge because the homeowners would assume that all those other renters in the community don't have a stake in the community, right? They don't think or care about the community as much as they do. So you have all these levels of kind of cultural issues on the one hand. But I want to come back to what I named in my presentation, what we talk about is operating culture, right? What is the way things work in a place? And how do we give attention to that? Whether it's simply a building or a floor or a public space, and we think there needs to be much more attention. And very often, we think about what residents will bring to that and the, the culture they'll bring. But what we're finding is it's incredibly important to think about the staff, the professionals, the property managers, the maintenance folks, the school principal, right? What culture are they bringing to the way things work, the way they interact with the residents, the way they interact with community members. So we're seeing that as a point of leverage if we can kind of elevate the discussion around that kind of culture. <clears throat> hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sid. I sit on the Beltline Urban Development Committee, which is just, which is a small, not a small neighborhood, which is like the densest neighborhood in the city, just south of downtown and, and west of here. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for pu putting up such beautiful presentations. It was really uh, nice listening to every single one of you. Uh, my question comes from studying like the best, practice, best practices in the housing affordability sector across the world. And one name that kind of stands out from everybody else is Singapore. The city state has um, you know, virtually no homelessness and despite Extraordin extraordinary, um, uh, uh, you know, expense that that comes with living in a city state like that. Um, you know, the housing affordability is is so much better as compared to similar cities such as London and Hong Kong and Amsterdam and, and New York City. Um, and and you know, despite despite uh, like I said, being so expensive, 80% of the population, the permanent the permanent residents own uh, own their homes and and. You know, and there's other factors that come into play. You know, the, the state ensures that there's racial cohesion. It ensures that there are quotas, you know, in every single building. So everyone cannot just like, no one can just like, you know, pick up their stuff and just like grab their stuff and go, you know, start living somewhere. There has to be a certain, you know, quotas of, of, of racial races that live in those, in those buildings. So my question is, why hasn't the West kind of taken up on that matter? And like, why aren't we taking those best practices and doing something like that here, and, and what could be the possible challenges that would come with, with implementing a system like that? Uh, uh, well, I'm not an expert on Singapore, but I, uh, for, there would be a, a number of very major challenges in implementing that system in trying to retrofit it on any existing housing market because it's basically a command system where the government controls the, con the entire housing sector. So to bolt that onto a system where you have individual decision makers operating in a market, individual landowners deciding whether to sell their land or not, whether to develop it or not, I mean it would it would basically be a revolution. You could, you could start it from the beginning if you bought your own island and wanted to create a country. <laughs> but uh, to, to, to do it in a system that's already there, I think, would, would not be feasible. Um, 
and, and also Singapore is exceptional nation state. The, the average height of a residential building is 57 stories, which is higher than the bow. Um, and indeed, uh, there is command and control, extensively subsidized and carefully monitored uh, to the point where indeed the, the mix of people uh, from the point of ethnicity, race, but also income is controlled on a building level. Um, a fascinating story, but indeed very, very difficult to um, even implement in a place that is somewhat similar, or used to have a similar system, Hong Kong. Um, but an inspiring, an inspiring lesson for all of us uh, in terms of creating that um, uh, inclusive um, community of, of people uh, that, that share this common asset in, in the city and indeed the public space uh, and, uh, and also a number of opportunities that Singapore provides. Uh, Steve Pomeroy from uh, Carlton University. I, I just want to uh, identify a really interesting uh, example in Canada, which actually Marietta and Kath will get to see the next weekend when you're down in Vancouver. We, we had a, a great experiment in, in this country in the early 70s where we got into the community-based nonprofit model and the Falls Creek area of Vancouver was deliberately developed with an intentional mix of 20% of the units were going to be for non-market non housing, co-ops, non-profits, and they were built cheek by jowl with private market rental and, and condos. Five years into that experiment, there was a post-occupancy evaluation study that looked at the integration and interaction of the different residents of the different tenures, and they found that the, the people that lived in the market rental and the condo units had a very large social network, and they would get in their car and go and visit their friends in West Vancouver and Carisdale and other parts of Vancouver and Clay and those playgrounds over there. And the residents of the non-market housing would all actually stay in, in the immediate neighborhood, so never the two did meet. Even though you had playgrounds, you had public realm, you had public space. So there was a sort of, you know, almost a self-sorting process in, in, in what actually evolved from what the planners thought was going to be a naturally integrated kind of community. So I just wonder from your experience, and yours particularly, Mark, in, in the work you're doing, you know, have you seen that kind of examination post hoc of what went on? And I, and I think certainly in the Vancouver case, it would be absolutely fascinating now, 40 years later, to go back and replicate that research and sort of see what now happens in, the, in those communities. But I'd be interested in your experience. Well, I'm going to grab this very quickly on the way down to passing it to Mark, just to say that um, we've just finished a study of 14 high-density housing schemes in London for the mayor of London. And uh, all of these had um, more than 200 units. Some of them had up to 3,000. And we asked residents of these schemes, which were all built in the last 10 years, how many other people they knew in the scheme, how important they thought it was to have a sense of community in their homes. Um, most of them knew very few other people in their schemes, zero to five. Um, only 2% of them said that a sense of community was something important to them in their homes. And when we went and spoke to them in more detail, had focus groups, looked at, 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 at the reasons for this, they said, why do I want to be friends with the people who happen to live in the same block as I do? I, I live in London. I live right on top of a tube station. My friends are all over the city. I can just go down and go see my friends. Well, you know, why, why does it matter that I don't know anybody in this development? And again, as I said before, these are mostly people who don't have children. So they just really weren't bothered by that at all. Maybe I can also grab <laughs> quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do a research project myself, but I did read about research results in the Netherlands. And generally, apparently, the result seems to be that the neighborhood gets better, but the um, intercommunication between groups does not. And yeah, no, there's a burgeoning amount of research now looking at post-occupancy, and it does find all the same. The reason we have an effective neighboring project in Cleveland is because we believe the art of neighboring has been lost. And so we're really trying to, put, like how hard, do you, how intentional do you have to be to get people to neighbor and to have it kind of stick again. What's been interesting to us is we've kind of studied and watched these developments, several of them now post-occupancy, is just how instinctive this sense of us versus them 
is. And so even in those developments where you have a developer, a property manager who's rather innovative, is kind of holding activities. I remember in coming to an interview in a higher income resident's home, um, and it was the day that there was this uh, back to school barbecue coming up that the property manager had put together. And obviously was intended on their part for the entire community, something that was gonna intentionally bring people together. So I went to visit with this higher income resident and she said, oh, mixed income, yeah, you know, I got this flyer under my door for this back to school barbecue that was mistakenly put under my door. And she said, because that's for them. And so I was able to ask her, well, what about this flyer makes you think it's not for you? In fact, you have kids. They're going back to school. You eat. <laughs> like, what? But she was just, and she couldn't. Then it was kind of like took her aback. But there was just something she assumed because it was programmed, I guess. It felt servicey in a way that it was odd that someone would do that. So that must be for them. And you hear that kind of in both directions. And so again, you saw the work that we've dumped, jumped into with our consulting partners is just how much you have to kind of intervene and go overboard to make it clear that it, this is a community where all of us are expected to be engaged and come out to these types of events. But you really have to go overboard to do it. Just add a couple points to that briefly. You know, I think there's a lot of variation in mixed income housing in terms of the levels of income, race, family type, and you can find examples of interaction among people of different income groups, but it isn't everywhere. I think if you have families with children, they're more likely to have it than if you have single young professionals and families with children. And I think if you have like this 80-20 model where you have a small number of lower income people and 80% are higher income, you're less likely to see it. But it can be done, it has been done, it usually has to be intentional on the part of the management and the staff. Uh, thank you, uh, a last question? Thank you, panel, for all the presentations. My name is Mohammed. I'm an architect. And I'm just curious on your view on um, what do you think is more uh, a more successful approach for affordable housing uh, when a building is already existing and it's going through a renovation or retrofit, or if it's uh, through newer developments and through new policies of these inclusion um, zonings? Um, the inclusionary zoning is specifically a, a policy and planning instrument that deals with new development. Uh, so as, as part of the planning permit process, a certain percentage is, is regulated and dedicated to be built as affordable rental housing or social housing, and that varies from 20% um, in London, 30% in, in Paris, 25%. In, in some places, uh, like Singapore, it, it goes up to 95%. So that is when you're building new homes. But the, the question of retrofitting is, is perhaps very different, where some of the urban regeneration schemes uh, across different cities are looking at um, reinstating, again, a certain balance between rental and ownership housing. So. The example from Amsterdam is, is really an interesting example where some people feel that there is too much social housing. So you need to begin to privatize some of it so that you begin to infuse these projects. And, and this is also some of the stories that, that Kath shared with us. So that you begin to infuse these projects with an income mix. It's kind of social engineering encapsulated in the built form. Uh, difficult to manage, as, as Mark pointed out, and, and also Alex, uh, social capital and community building takes a very long time. And it, it doesn't have to be just exclusively tied to a particular housing development. But indeed, uh, a lot of the good practices around the world will demonstrate that it, it's, it's much better to create a place that welcomes people from different walks of life, different ethnic groups, different income groups, so that children perhaps share the playground, share the street, go to the same school. And that is how you start uh, building a city. And that was the city building model in the old days as well. So we're not inventing anything new. 
we're just going back um, to, uh, to something which was a more inclusive city to begin with. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do have the microphone, so I'm throwing one quick question out. Um, I'm just wondering, in your experience, how you define affordable? Is there a formula? How, what, it, what is that based on? Uh, in the UK at the moment, there are, there are legal definitions of affordable. Um, the, the legal definition of affordable housing is, uh, uh, for rental housing, is housing that rents for 80% or less of market rent in that local area, which is quite narrowly defined. So if you're talking about the local area around um, Kensington Palace, uh, you know, market rent would be many thousands of pounds a week, and 80% of market rent is still not affordable for <laughs> most people. Um, so th that's the legal definition, and th there's all kinds of political discussion now about how to create genuinely affordable housing that, that really is affordable to people on lower incomes. It's a complicated question. Uh, in the United States, housing is considered affordable if you're paying roughly 30% of your income on housing costs or on rent. Uh, but in terms of the incomes that are um, targeted for affordable housing, that varies. With the largest uh, supply side program in the United States, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, the uh, targeted income is 60% of area median family income, which for a family of four translates to about $62,000, and that's considered affordable. There are many people who earn much less than that and cannot afford to live in this so-called affordable housing unless they have additional subsidies. People in public housing or with vouchers, the incomes are much lower, but there's very little growth in those programs. Yes, a complicated question. You can measure it in different ways. Uh, in my opinion, um, you should look at the whole package of, uh, you know, something like a basic income should be a starting point. And then uh, you, as a society, you determine uh, what uh, should be in such a package and what people could, should then be able to pay. Yeah? It's always a subjective uh, matter. But then you have different instruments, like for instance in the Netherlands, uh, most of the rental stock is still rent controlled. Even if the owner is private, uh, it's not only social stock, so any housing up until um, the limit of 710 euros per month, which is still about 80% of rental stock, um, is rent controlled. Politically, each year, the government takes a decision how much rents go up. Uh, next to that, there are also housing allowances, uh, which is something like a housing benefit or um, that people can get, and those uh, formulas are somehow based on uh, a percentage of income, and also taking into account whether you're retired or not, and your family composition. So my understanding is that it uh, used to be 20% when the housing allowances were introduced in the Netherlands, and meanwhile, it's about 30%. In the mortgage market, there are also the 30% is being used as like a benchmark. But obviously, I mean, a one-person household can more easily pay 30% than a five-person household with the same income. So, but yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think that that is the end of, of our public debate today. I, I would like to... Um, thank the, the panelists for their excellent presentations and also a very, very engaging discussion that followed. Thank you to all of you. Um, we would continue that conversation. It is about affordable housing. It is essentially about low-income people, but also young professionals, middle-income families. We all need it in our big cities, in, in the Canadian cities, as well as in Calgary. We, at this point in time, we would like to be the average city. We don't want to be the exception to the rule. And that is quite exceptional in its own right in this city where it's all about being first and setting the tone for a lot of entrepreneurial discussions and initiatives. But 
We would like to be part of that conversation at the university and we are continuing tomorrow with our uh, three-day conference. Um, it's a smaller circle indeed of about 60 people, but we are very, very much committed to sharing our knowledge, understanding and our research and to help you all out there in practice and in the world making a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.